Venerable <coughs> Chancellor Sierra, Belisa Maharata Guru Sierra, the most venerable Rector Sierra, distinguished scholars and graduates. It is <coughs> a great privilege for me to address this learned gathering of scholars and graduates at this convocation ceremony of Sidigu International Academy, Sakai, the Union of Myanmar today. <coughs> First, let me congratulate Sidigu International Buddhist Academy celebrating its third convocation and also today's graduates for their success. And today, in this <coughs> short address, I wish to draw your attention to the importance of orientating Buddhist higher institutions such as Siddhigu International Buddhist Academy towards public service. As we all know, the Buddha's enlightening words came from his own personal experiment. He experimented real life, very much as we still know it now, and used that experiential wisdom to connect with all human problems, both inherent and voluntary. It was this extraordinary understanding of all human beings of all social status, nationalities, and genders that transform and universalized his outlook and compassion. With that universal outlook that the Buddha came to have an appeal beyond caste, social status, wealth, creed, and gender, the Buddha served humanity throughout his 45 years of missionary life. Despite this, some people misperceive Buddhism, especially Theravada Buddhism, as being self-centered and less concerned about the welfare of others. They argued that Theravada Buddhism focuses only on individual liberation that is arahathood, and does not concern itself with the welfare of the many. Venerable says, ladies and gentlemen, needless to say that I think this is a misunderstanding. This misperception may have come from the fact that Theravada Buddhism strongly and consistently advocates self-reliance in the path to liberation. For instance, during the intensive practice, a practice of Theravada Buddhism usually minimizes, if he doesn't cut off altogether, most social context. Instead, practitioners usually focus on advancing themselves first, towards enlightenment before they return to the society and shoulder some social pro responsibilities. The practitioners are even advised to stay as one horned rhino, not indulging in companionship with any who is not serious on the path. Here at Siddhigu International Buddhist Academy, the founder and chancellor, the most venerable Professor Dr. Ashinya Nisra, who has just been newly conferred on the highest Buddhist ecclesiastical title in Myanmar, a Bidaja Maharajakuru, three days ago, is a good example of the compatibility between Theravada Buddhism and public service. In the last five decades, Siddhigu Siaroji has been serving the public as public speaker and educator. For the last 40 years or so, 
as a social welfare provider. On a daily basis, he provides water to thousands of monasteries and nunneries and medical care, especially eye treatments in 32 hospitals and more. Siddhigu Siaroji emphasizes as evidence in the Siddhigu resolution, Tidigu data, the importance of leaving behind an inspiring legacy, Bawa Tamai Mayaisiya. To do that, one needs to be public service minded. Do ta tana, do pi yuago, ta ya se mu, long la pu. The founder, Rector Siaro, the most venerable Akka Mahapandita, Professor Dr. Nanda Mahapiyamsa, is equally public service oriented in his outlook and action. This is clearly demonstrated in the national recognition he receives as an excellent educator and one of the most respected public speakers. Both the Chancellor Sierra and the Rector Sierra are keen on and capable in applying Buddhism. However, we have to admit that visionary leaders like the two most respected heroes are not common among us. This is despite the fact that there is no whatsoever doctrinal problem between Theravada Buddhism and engaged Buddhism. I think <clears throat> to convince a considerable number of doubters we, the Sangha in particular, in higher education institutions like Siddhiku, we have to focus more on the application of the Buddha's teaching in different areas. If we look at what happens in the West today, we can see some fruits of applying Buddhism. Just look at booming study and application of mindfulness in the United States of America, Europe, and elsewhere since 1979. Most of the top universities I have visited in the United States, Canada, Britain, and Spain have research programs on mindfulness meditation, satipatthana, and psychology, neurology, and medicine. First, in 1979, Professor John Kabazin, a physician from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, USA, started using mindfulness to help his patients who suffer from chronic pain. That was to teach patients how to learn about pain and their reaction to pain. This way, they can stop multiplying the pain through subconscious mind, where stress is unnecessarily increased and sustained. Over there, it was found that many people have benefited from the program, which has come to be known as Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. MBSR. Almost 20 years later, Professor Kabasin founded the Center for Mindfulness in Medicine. Two years ago, there was less than two decades after the Center for Mindfulness in Medicine was founded, exactly in October 2015. A researcher by the name of Laura Bushholz wrote in her article in the Journey of the American Medical Association, JAMA, under the title Exploring the Promise of Mindfulness as Medicine. I quote, 
Today, close to 80% medical schools offer some element of mindfulness training and research and education centers dedicated to mindfulness have proliferated." End quote. At Oxford and Cambridge University in Britain, clinical psychologists have studied med meditation and also the MBSR method from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and then did research on people suffering from relapses in depression. This program, which came to be known as MBST, Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Therapy, has a center at Oxford University. I have the privilege of being one of its first founding trustees. The founder, Professor Mark Williams, said to me that the Bible on meditation is the book that we all know the heart of Buddhist meditation. The author of this famous book, the late German scholar, monk, and meditation teacher, Jnana Punika Thera, studied the Satipatthana meditation under the late Mahasi Sero and recounted his meditation experiences in a way that Westerners would understand. Here we can see how meditation centers can be at the very heart of engaged Buddhism. Today, Buddhist meditation and scientific research programs have gone a lot further to include the study of emotion and brain. One of such undertakings has resulted in overturning the earlier scientific belief, especially in biology that says the brain, once damaged, could not be cured. As all medics know, scientists such as Broca, Wernick, and Korsakoff were some of the earliest to have studied brain injury. But today, with the latest technologies using fMRI, EEG, and the like, on the one hand, and on the other, employing mindfulness-based many Buddhist meditation techniques, it is now believed that many brain injuries can be cured. It is founded Um, it is found that if the patient has mindfulness training to regulate their emotions, then their brain cells that are not damaged can rewire themselves with other healthy neurons. And then together, they heal the brain itself. There is a book for non-specialists like us on the subject written by Dr. Norman Deutsch from Columbia University. The title of the book is The Brain That Heals Itself. This new discovery has come to be known as neuroplasticity theory. This discovery has attracted many people to meditation practice. <clears throat> Today, Many multinational corporates, such as Google, Dell, Microsoft, Apple, provide a meditation room in their workplaces. In 2015, in the United Kingdom, where I have been living for the last 21 years, the All Parties Parliamentary Committee on Mindfulness in the Westminster Parliament published its report called Mindful Nation UK 2015. This report is available on the internet. 
The report suggests ways and means to bring mindfulness to schools and government departments across the country. If we can call this development as part of engaged Buddhism, such development is not new to Myanmar. Buddhist teaching has been applied by the monks outside their monasteries here before. For instance, in 1860, the founder of Shui Jin Nikaya, Shui Jin Siaroji, wrote a letter to King Mindong. Such a letter is called Mittasa, a letter of compassion. With the letter, Shui Jin Siaroji appealed to the king not to put up taxes. The king had to put up taxes because Lower Burma fell under the British and Upper Myanmar had to compensate the British according to the term agreed between the two. So Shui Jin Siaroji appealed to the king not to put up taxes but to keep it only at 10% maximum. He called from the commentary to the Vinaya Samanda Pasatika and he put it in Burmese, Se Kain Da Kain Da Kaukansi. We can read this original letter in the book by the name of Collected Ubede, volume number one page 1 to 10. Those days, the leading Sierras concerned themselves with justice and fairness for all citizens. From fairness and justice, there came among the people unity, respect, peace. The most venerable Chancellor Sierra, the most venerable Rector Sierra, distinguished scholars, graduates, ladies and gentlemen, with this note, I want to conclude that Buddhist University, like Sidigu International Buddhist Academy, has a lot to offer and to serve the public. All it needs is compassion-based public service orientation. I believe graduates today will embrace programs of the society and the world with public service oriented outlook. Thank you. ကျောင်းစင်းကုန်ကြူးစကားပြောပြပြီးပါတော့ပရော်ဖက်ဆာတောက်တာ <coughs> <coughs>